Good morning, Reclaim. Good morning. I know y'all are louder than that because I just listened to you worship. And uh, let me just tell you, wow. We may not be mighty in size, but I'm going to tell you the way you lifted your voices to the Lord just a little while ago. I was standing over there, and I'm telling you, if we didn't grow by one more person, and we just kept seeking and chasing the Lord with this body of believers right here, I'm telling you what, you are going to move mountains. I'm just telling you right now. But I am honored, we are honored to be your pastors and, and uh, to be a part of this amazing church and God's church. And we welcome you here. And if you're new, uh, you know, we, uh, we just, we really, we invite you to come and be a part of this journey that God has us on. And, and I thought I'd start this morning with a, a little story. It's a story about this guy and he was traveling. He was on a, a long trip and he, uh, he was finally at the airport. He was in between his connecting flights and he was tired and he was cranky and he was a little hungry. And so he decided to, to walk himself over to the cafe while he was waiting. And, and uh, he went ahead and he ordered himself a coffee and he ordered a little bag of cookies. They had these amazing cookies right there in the, the counter. And so uh, the cashier rang him up and gave him his cookies and his coffee. And he, he scooped up his stuff and started scanning the, the terminal to find a place. And he found one of those high top tables and there was a guy sitting there and there was an open seat next to him. And he, so he went over there and he, he, uh, he walked over and he started setting down his stuff and he looked at the other guy and they gave that kind of that guy look. You know, you guys, you know what I'm talking about. We're like, mm, yeah, mm. You, know, you didn't have to say a word. You just give that look and that nod and it's like, okay, I'm here, right? And so he sat down and he got out his phone and he started flipping through some emails and sipping on his coffee and, and uh, he, he reached over and he, he reached into the bag of cookies and grabbed a cookie and as he grabbed a cookie, the guy kind of looked at him again. He looked at the guy again and they gave each other a nod and he started eating his cookie. Well, a few minutes later, as he was uh, reading another email, he noticed out of the corner of his eye that the guy he was sitting next to reaches into the bag of cookies and grabs a cookie. And he pulls it out and he starts eating it and they have that look again, but this time his look isn't so favorable. He's like, and in his mind he's going, are you serious right now? I cannot believe this guy just reached into my cookies and he's eating one of my cookies, but he's like, not a big deal. There's a couple more in there and you know, just whatever. And so he reaches and he grabs another cookie and continues to eat it. Finally, all of a sudden, over the terminal speakers, they announce a couple of the flights are getting ready to board, and, and obviously both their flights were called, so they start scooping up their stuff. They start getting ready to, to head to their appropriate gates, and, and, and they both look down at the bag of cookies, and, and the guy that was sitting there kind of looks over, and he, he reaches into the bag and grabs the last cookie, and he takes the cookie out, and he looks at our traveler, and he looks down at the cookie, and, and he looks at him again, and he breaks it in half. He hands him half of it. He sticks the other half in his mouth. He smiles, gives him a wink, and goes boogieing down the terminal. Now, our guy is like, are you out of your mind, right? He's like, the nerve of the, and he's thinking to himself, the nerve of this guy to reach into my cookies and take the last one and give me half? Like, really? And so, just frustrated, he knows he's going to miss his gate if he doesn't hurry, and he's like, okay, whatever. He gets to his gate, he boards the plane, he shuffles in, he's so frustrated, he gets to his seat, he sits down with his bag, he is stewing over what just happened, and so he knows he's got to shut his phone off, you know, turn it off, all that stuff, and he, he grabs his bag, he goes to get out his book to read, and as he's reaching in to his bag... He reaches in and he pulls out a bag of cookies. And he just has his heart sink. This whole time when he was getting frustrated and angry and was about to light this guy up, he was the cookie thief and the other man really had the bag of cookies and he was being kind and generous with our guy. You know, sometimes, church family, things aren't always as they appear to be, are they? And sometimes we can make assumptions about people or situations or circumstances. We can be so quick to pass judgment without having all of the information. Well, today, as we are in the last couple of weeks of our study on the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus' most famous sermon ever, we, we are going to study a very small topic. As Jesus begins to land the plane, he has a lesson for us on this topic of judgment and relationships in our lives. But before we dig in, would you pray with me this morning? 
Lord, we just, uh, God, we come to you. We come to you after battle in a hard week. We come to you broken. We come to you wore out. Uh, God, we come with, with all of our stuff, Lord. We, we come just to, to, to seek your face, God. And, and some of us, maybe we're sitting here and we don't even know why we're here, Lord, but I know that you have a divine word for each and every one of us. So God, I pray in my own brokenness, I pray in my, my own sinfulness, I, I pray in my own flesh that I would get out of the way, Lord, so that you could speak through me, so that you could deliver a message that's so intimate to each and every one of us here this morning that we walk out of here stronger and more fulfilled and more complete than we came in. God, we thank you for your word today. We are so excited to listen to what you have to say. And it is in your mighty and precious name we pray. And everyone said, amen. amen. So there's this book that was written a handful of years ago. Ironically, that's actually the book that, that's in the bag, but it was written uh, by a guy by the name of, of George Barna. And he is the president of a company called the Barna Group. And they are a research firm or a study firm that actually does, they do uh, like surveys and they do all kinds of research and, and they gain metrics and demographic studies. And they basically put together data to help mostly churches, to help them grow better and faster and stronger. And, and so they take this data and, and they obviously, they publish it and they do all kinds of different things with it. Well, they did a study once and, and in this book, uh, Unchristian, they did a study that revealed some of the stats on what the unchurched world really thought about Christians and believers. And when they were asked to give an image or a description of a Christian, there were three not so complimentary words that came out of this survey that dominated at the top of the list. Can any of you guess what the three words were? Hypocrite, Hypocrite yep, that was one of them. Judgmental, yeah, that was 87% of the unchurched community said judgmental. And then the third one was anti-homosexual. Now, you know what? Christians were also described down the list a little bit as being insensitive and boring. And I don't know, hypocritical, judgmental, but insensitive and boring? I mean, I'm a little offended by those, right? We're fun, aren't we? I mean, we have a good time. We're not boring, right? I mean, we hang out, we go, some of you should have seen us putting on our dance moves last night. It was a good thing, right? I'm like, if any of those Facebook videos get posted, I'm just not showing up Sunday morning. I'm just saying. And I was only drinking water, just so yeah, let's get that clear, okay? But, but here's the thing, is it that we get labeled. And on a serious note, I, but I want, I want to ask you this. On a serious note, how many of you here have ever known someone, a Christian, that was judgmental or hypocritical, right? Yeah, I mean, so there's gotta be some truth to what they're saying. There's gotta be some truth behind those demographics and those studies and those, those, uh, those uh, surveys. And the scary thing is, though, is that Jesus doesn't teach or condone any of those attitudes amongst his believers. But yet, literally, the top three labels for Christians, that's what we get from the outside world. Now, it is true that we are not supposed to blend in, right? Jesus calls us to be different. He calls us to be a counterculture. I mean, that's the whole point of his rather intense and somewhat unapologetic Sermon on the Mount. He shows us and he tells us what it's all about. But this culture that he calls us to is not supposed to be the one that tears down or condemns the world around us. We are called to be a light and to make this world a better place for all people. Amen? So let's go ahead. Let's, let's begin our study for this morning. Um, we've got a lot of ground to cover. I promised you that we were going to finish the Sermon on the Week before anniversary weekend, um, which is in two weeks from now. So we have an entire chapter to cover between today and next Sunday. So we're going to dig in. We're going to go through a lot of scripture. But I made a promise to you, and I'm going to finish one way or the other. And we'll start something new for anniversary weekend, OK? So if you will, get out your smart devices, your phones. It'll be up on the screen. If you need a Bible, if you don't own one, We've got Bibles out in the connect counter. Make sure to grab one, our gift to you after service. But we're gonna go to uh, Matthew chapter seven and we are gonna start out in the first six verses. Matthew chapter seven, verses one to six. Here we go. Judge not that you be not judged. For with the judgment that you pronounce, you will be judged. And with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. 
Why do you see the speck that's in your brother's eye, but you don't notice the log that's in your own eye? Or how can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye when there's a log in your own eye? You hypocrite. First take the log out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to take the speck out of your brother's eye. Do not give to the dogs what is holy, and do not throw your pearls before pigs, lest they trample them underfoot, and they turn and they attack you. So here's our first point for today. It's probably a pretty obvious one. You could probably guess what it is. Number one, Jesus says, don't be judgmental. Don't be judgmental. Now, I know it's, it's, it's safe to say that none of us here in this room are judgmental, right? This, so this doesn't apply to us, most likely. In fact, it's funny when you call it, talk about judgmentalism, because have you ever noticed nobody ever describes themselves as, as judgmental? But we all know somebody that is judgmental, right? You know, and maybe we're being judgmental by saying they're judgmental. I don't know. But, but here's the thing. We all know someone, so let's just, we're going to take notes for them today. Fair enough? In fact, turn to your neighbor and say, don't worry, these notes aren't for you. Go ahead, tell them that they're not for you. Now, I don't know, maybe it's just me, but this passage was confusing to me for many, many years, and this is why. And we've all heard this passage, haven't we? We've, we've all heard, in fact, this is another one of those verses, this is another one of those sayings that even the non-believers, the non-Christian world will actually throw around from time to time, right? Judge not, right? Don't judge me, judge not, lest the hind thee side ye, ye judge notest, right? <laughs> it's amazing they like use that New King James version, right? Hast thou died, not judgest thy stuff, you know? And, and so... So, so people, it's a statement that, that people use to defend a universal acceptance of any lifestyle or behavior, right? It kind of falls in line with that mentality, like you do you and I'll do me, and let's just not, you know, don't judge me, I won't judge you. And, and on a side note here, Jesus calls us to love unconditionally. Our love is unconditional. It doesn't matter what somebody does, who they are, where they are, what they've been through. It doesn't matter their lifestyle. Jesus calls us to love them unconditionally, period, end of story. But he does not call us to unconditionally accept. And that's a sermon for a whole nother day. But here's the thing is this whole judgment thing. The dilemma with this passage is that Jesus tells us don't, du don't judge, right? But then two verses later, he says that we need to help our brother out with the specks in their eye, but if we're not supposed to judge whether or not they got specks, how are we supposed to help them out with the, the stick sticking out of their eye, right? And so you go, okay, wait a minute, that's a little bit of a dilemma here. Or, or how about the whole dogs and pig thing in a couple more verses down? He says, don't throw what is holy to the dogs and cast your pearls to the swine. If we don't make a judgment, who are the dogs and the swine? How are we supposed to figure that one out? Or if you go down a little further next week, verses 15 to 20, Jesus tells us, beware of false prophets and you will know them by their fruit or their lack of. And so what, how in the world are we supposed to know who's a false prophet unless we judge their fruit or their lack of it, right? In Romans, Romans calls us to judge if someone is causing division within the church. In Hebrews, God calls us to judge between good and evil. In 1 Corinthians chapter 5, Paul says in his instructions to the church, he says, is it not those inside the church whom you are to judge? God judges those outside, purge the evil from within. So are we to judge or are we to not to judge? Well, the answer is found in the word itself. The word for judge, the Greek word was krino. Okay, say that all with me. Y'all like, I'm not gonna say that. Krino, right? Krino. And krino can mean to analyze or to evaluate, but it can also mean to condemn or to avenge. It's kind of like the difference between saying, I'm gonna judge an art competition or I'm gonna judge my brother right now who is deep in sin, who has an addiction in gambling and is spending all of his family's money. There's two different meanings to the word judge in those two different scenarios, amen? amen. But you see, as believers, it is a fact. We are called to judge as we read in some of these scriptures, but the judgment is not, the, the judgment is not based on that second definition. The judgment is based on that first definition of the word, which is to analyze or to evaluate. That second word, to condemn or to avenge, is for God and God alone. 
It may not be, it is not my place, it is not our place to condemn a friend, a believer, or a non-believer because of anything going on in their lives. Not our place to do that. And you see, the behavior that, that Jesus is talking about here, the judgment that he's talking about here, he was talking to the Pharisees. Remember, the religious elite, he was talking about what they were doing because they were self-righteous, they were unmerciful, they were unforgiving, they were judgmental, they were censorious, okay? How many of you here know what the word censorious means? Good, okay, so here you go, you ready? This is good. So, because so, it kind of sounds like sensational, right? So censorious actually means, the definition of censorious is someone who is severely critical or a fault finder or negative and destructive and condemning of others. So considering most of us don't know what that word means, you ever come across somebody that's one of those, you can go, man, you are censorious, right? And they won't even know that you're, you're kind of judging them, right? So no, I'm just kidding. But, but they, the, the Pharisees, they were censorious, they look down on everybody as being inferior to them. Now, in reality, we all deal with people like that all the time, don't we? I mean, it's a fact. It could be our boss, it could be a coworker, it could be a teacher, it could be a spouse, it could be a family member, it could be a parent, it could be a, another believer, it could even be a pastor. And you know, church family, I, I would be hypocritical to stand up here and tell you that, that I never, I'm never judgmental like the Pharisees because I struggle too. I, 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 it can creep in sometimes when I see people just blatantly making stupid decisions or I, I see people just so lackadaisical in their faith. It, it can happen sometimes when people leave our church with no communication. We don't know why. You know, We're always like, hey, it's okay. We're, we're okay. We're thick skinned. Just tell us, is there something we're doing good or bad or am I ugly or what is it? You know, I can take it, right? Or, or maybe they come up with some kind of crazy story that you're like, what? What? You, you have, your dog needs medicine every 45 minutes and the extra six minutes to get to reclaim was too far and so you, you know, it's just, it's one of those, but I'm human. I have a fleshly side and sometimes I judge and it's like, no, it's not okay. See, people become judgmental sometimes to make themselves feel better. They become judgmental sometimes as a defense mechanism for feelings of inadequacy or an attempt to gain power and control. That's some of the, the characteristics behind judgmentalism. Here's some signs of being judgmental in a censorious sense, okay? Censorious, right? You guys, are, you guys learned something new today. Isn't that cool, right? But here it is. Number one, you believe that everybody's out to get you. Number two, you expect other people to be consistent all the time. Number three, you struggle to see beyond a person's flaws. Number four, you easily skip to conclusions. Number five, you struggle to tolerate ambiguity and uncertainty. Number six, you're intolerant of people unlike you. Number seven, you're generally pessimistic about life. Number eight, you tend to believe people are either good or bad. There's nothing in between. Number nine, you struggle to truly appreciate or see the beauty in others. Number 10, you have a low self-worth. Number 11, you feel anxious around other people. Number 12, you're suspicious and untrusting. Number 13, you have a strong inner critic who judges you. Now, that doesn't mean that if, that if you fall into any of these, you're judgmental. This is just, this is a psychology study that said these are some of the characteristics of somebody who may struggle with judgmentalism. But remember, it is not our job to judge or to condemn or to pass judgment in a critical way or to look down on others as not being as holy as we are or as committed or as faithful. It is not our job to judge those who not, have not accepted Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior because they're quote unquote inferior of us. No way. Not our job to do that. In fact, Jesus tells a story of a Pharisee and a tax collector in Luke chapter 18 that displays, this Pharisee displays this judgmental, censorious spirit and how it repulses God. He says this, the Pharisee stood by himself and prayed, God, I thank you that I'm not like the other people, the robbers, the evildoers, the adulterers, or even like that tax collector. I fast twice a week, I give a tenth of all I get. But the tax collector, well, the tax collector stood at a distance. He wouldn't even look up to heaven, but he beat his breast and he said, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. And the Lord says this, I tell you that that man, rather than the other, went home justified before God. For all those who exalt themselves will be humbled and all those who humble themselves will be exalted. See, we gotta remember, we learned it in the beginning of the Sermon on the Mount, the Beatitudes, 
Remember, Jesus calls us to be humble and meek. He calls us to thirst for righteousness. He calls us to be peacemakers. He calls us to be merciful and to be pure in heart. And all of those characteristics are contrary to someone who is judgmental. And Jesus warns us, if we begin to judge with a censorious spirit, then we should expect to be judged by God the same way. It says the measure that we use will be used to measure us back. I don't know about you, but that's kind of scary, amen? So then how are we supposed to judge if there is a way that we are supposed to judge? Well, here it is. You can write this down. We are to judge with authenticity and love. To judge with authenticity and love. You heard Lindsay say it a couple minutes ago, but you know, really this was one of the founding principles that God laid on our hearts when we started Reclaim. It was to create an authentic place for people to find and follow Jesus, a place where there was no judgment, a place where there was no hypocrisy. We will be the first to admit sometimes we got some big old logs sticking out of our eyes, okay? It's a church where it's safe to bring your baggage. It's a church where you can bring all your logs and splinters, and I'll tell you what, we'll all become lumberjacks, and we'll reclaim all that stinking wood, and we'll make some cool stuff out of it, amen? We'll build some more counters out in the lobby with all that wood, because it's okay to bring it in and to deal with it. See, Jesus encourages us to help each other in this passage with the logs and the specks, which are the sins and the struggles in our lives. Why? Because that's what a family does. But Jesus says before we begin to try to help others, before we start doing some eye surgery, he says we need to examine, examine our own eyes, right? Make sure that we're addressing the own, our own sins in our lives, that we're examining our hearts daily so that we can see clearly. Because I don't know about you, but I don't want no blind eye surgeon working on my eyes, right? We need to see clearly before we can help others. It's almost like when you hear, you know when you hear, um, when you, you take a plane flight, I'm talking about planes a lot today. Maybe I'm supposed to go on a trip, I don't know, you know. So you wanna send me somewhere, that's cool, I'm, I'm open to it, all right? Um, but, but you remember you know, when the flight attendant, they say, you know, about the whole air mask, right? And they tell you, what do they tell you to do? They tell you if you need it, then first you need to put it on and securely fasten it, stretch it out, make sure it's working right before you can possibly put it on somebody else to help them out. It is the same thing here when it comes to sin, The same thing. See, when we come to our fellow brothers and sisters, when we come to them in humility and in authenticity and in the fact that we aren't perfect, then more people will invite us to help them get the specs out. And you see, the right kind of judgment is biblical. It's biblical. It falls within the confines of God's God's law and nothing more. And if we judge, it must be charitable. How are we helping the situation, not just pointing it out, amen? So in our next point, you can write this down if you're taking notes. The next thing Jesus tells us to do is don't waste time on the swine. Don't waste time on the swine. Verse six said what? It said, do not give to the dogs what is holy. Do not throw your pearls before pigs, lest they trample them underfoot and turn and attack you. Now you gotta understand where this passage came from or this verse came from. Dogs back in the day, they weren't man's best friend. Most dogs were, they were mangy, they were rough, they were, they were mean, they bit people, they were wild, they were diseased, they were savages. And pigs back in the day were the epitome of unclean in the Jewish culture. Which, you know, I mean, to me, I'm like, man, I'd have never been Jewish because I love bacon way too much. You guys, you with me, right? Yeah. In fact, they had, they had maple bacon covered donuts earlier for the, for the setup team. So y'all want maple bacon donuts, you better show up for setup. But, but they, they so, so the swine, the pig, was the epitome of unclean. So it was unacceptable to take any sacrifice or offering. When they made a sacrifice at the temple altar, a portion of it would go to the family, a portion of it would go to the priest, and there was a portion that would be burned at the altar. And it was actually against their law, against their religion, to even throw a scrap to the dog. And that's what he's talking about here, is you don't throw anything that is holy to the dogs. And pigs, you know what? Pigs had no interest in anything other than eating stuff. So if you threw pearls to the pig and they couldn't eat them, they would trample them underfoot. And they may even turn and attack you getting mad because you're not throwing them. It's like my dogs. If you don't throw them a treat, you better run, you know? It's just one of those same things. But you see, these two animals, they represent people in this world that because of their ungodlessness, they refuse to have anything to do with what is holy and the precious things of God except to trample them underfoot or to rip God's people to shreds. 
They will reject our attempts to share the good news of the gospel and they'll even scorn us and they'll mock us for our beliefs. You know, this verse is it, probably one of the hardest to swallow. It's probably one of the toughest to swallow in the Sermon on the Mount because it confirms to us that the reality is, is that some people we will walk away from and they won't know the Lord. It is sobering reality that some will not be saved. It's sad, but the word tells us that. But here's the thing, despite their attitudes, despite their rejection of us and our faith, we must remember that as citizens of the kingdom of God, we will still not pass critical judgment. We will not be upset. We will not be frustrated with those whose hearts are too hardened to hear. Why? Because Jesus calls us to unconditionally love and to turn the other cheek and still to be a testimony of the mercy and grace of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And if you're here today and you don't have a relationship with Jesus, I'll share with you what that means just in a few minutes as we close, and I'll invite you to start that relationship today. So what do we do? What do we do when we begin to struggle with judgment or we need some help with the log in our eye or knowing what to say to another brother or sister with a plank or a speck in theirs? Well, Jesus, in our next passage, he gives us some guidance as well as some more encouragement about the love that our heavenly father has for us. And it's where we find our next point. You can write this down if you're taking notes. Trust in the one who knows best. Trust in the one who knows best. Let's read these next few verses together, verses seven through 11. Jesus says this. He says, ask and it'll be given to you. Seek and you'll find it. Knock and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives and those who seek they find and those uh, who knock it will be opened. Or which one of you, if a son asks him for bread, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for fish, he'll give him a serpent? If you then, who are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father, who is in heaven, give good things to those who ask him? What an awesome promise of God, amen? I mean, how many of you needed to hear that today? There's a promise for you. Now, we might think that Jesus already covered prayer back in verse, or chapter six. Remember, he covered all kinds of stuff on, on prayer as a believer. He, he even went over the Lord's prayer with us and explained kind of that, how we should pray and, and what prayer should, should encompass. And then he explained last week when we went through the rest of chapter six, he explained that, that we can trust in God, that we don't have to worry if we trust in him. But in this passage, Jesus wants to reiterate the importance of both of those points and and let us know that the Father desires us to pursue him, to pursue our relationship with him just as any good father desires a relationship with his children. I'll never forget Deion Sanders. Some of you might be dating myself, but he, fantastic, amazing athlete. But Deion Sanders, who is also a believer, I listened to something that he said once, and he said it was, like, God's like that, that dad that, that's just sitting there in his chair. And we're those kids that are running around in front of dad, right? And, and it breaks dad's heart if all we do is run around and we ignore him. But when we see dad in that chair and we jump up in his lap and we hug on him and we love on him, that's all that God wants. God wants us to seek him. God wants us to ask him. God wants us to empower him in our lives. God's a gentleman. God doesn't force himself on you. God allows you to make the decision to believe in him. See, Jesus tells us right here we are to have an active faith to ask and to seek and to knock. Do you understand? Do you, do you hear? That is a progression. That's a progression of effort and intensity. We ask. We ask because we have wants and desires, right? I mean, any good child, if, if any of you have children, you know they ask, don't they? Some of them ask unmercifully, right? Hey, dad, hey, dad, hey, mom, hey, dad, hey, dad. It's like, it's wear you out, right? But God wants to hear our hopes and our dreams and desires. God wants us to ask him. And then we seek. We seek, which is a, a little more intense because then we don't just ask, 
But then we say, God, you know what? I want to know you at a deeper level. I want your will in my life. I want to seek your face. I want to seek your presence in my life. Sometimes our prayers need to be a little more intense and we start to seek. And then there's times when we knock. We just need to, we need to pound on that door. We need to go, God, I need you right now in this moment. Are you there, God? And you just pound on that door. Is that making sense? And you see, his word promises this. It says, you know what? Everyone who asks, receives. Everyone who seeks, finds. And the one who knocks, the door will be opened. See, Jesus tells us to approach the Father focused, persistent, and confident. And the creator of the heavens and the earth who loves us better and more complete than any earthly father will. He will always be for us. He will always be there. He'll provide for us. And his will for our lives is always perfect because he always knows best. Amen. Amen. See, we find our strength, our comfort, our wisdom, and our provision through prayer. And prayer is one of the best things we can do to fight a judgmental spirit in our lives. As well as taking care of our bodies and our health journaling our struggles, surrounding ourselves with other believers and supportive people to encourage us, staying in the word of God daily, learning how to forgive ourselves and realizing that we are all unique and precious in the eyes of our Father. And that is something to be adored in people, all people, never to be criticized. And Jesus wraps up our teaching for today with verse 12, which is known both on the inside and the outside of Christianity as the golden rule, right? How many of you have ever heard the term golden rule before, right? It's called the golden rule. Let's read it together. It's Matthew chapter seven, last verse, verse 12. And he says this, he says, so in everything, do to others what you would have them do to you, for this sums up the law and the prophets. And this right here, church family, is our final point for this morning. And it is, the choice is ours. The choice is ours. As I was writing my message this week, I, I'm gonna be totally transparent. I was excited when I got to verse 12 because I'm like, man, I'm in the home stretch. I'm landing the plane now. Everybody knows the golden rule. This is easy. I can explain this one in a breeze, you know, right? And, and so, and, and I'm telling you right now, when I stared at this verse, I stared at those 14 words and they absolutely shut me down. In fact, I don't know, can we put that verse back up on the screen? There it is. I want you to just look at those words for a minute. Because those words, they rocked my world. They were like a freight train this week. I truly think that this is one of the hardest verses of the entire Sermon on the Mount. This is the climax of Jesus' teaching right here to this point. This is our calling and our marching orders as believers. This one line defines the counterculture that Jesus calls us to live out. It says so, or in other translations other than the ESV, it might say therefore in your Bible. We've all been taught what, what therefore means, means basically Jesus saying all that other stuff we've talked about, okay? You got it so far, right? He says so. Now that you got that, he says, in everything. I want you to say that with me right now. In everything. Say it again. In everything. Not some things. He doesn't say, you know, just the things you want to. Jesus says we don't get to pick and choose our behavior or how we want to act and react. He says it doesn't matter if someone does us wrong. It doesn't matter if we're having a bad day. Jesus says, in everything everything he says do to others what you would have them do unto you now this is different church family this is different than any other religion that preaches something like this it's different it's been written in literature socrates all these other confucius they've they've written things very similar to this and in every other translation of the golden rule it is always written in a negative light it is written don't do but you see, when you write it that way, it minimizes our responsibility. It minimizes the expectation level. And this is what I mean by that. 
If someone's a complete jerk to me, right? If they're nasty to you, if they're awful to you, if you use it in a negative light, it says, well, as long as you're not nasty back, then it's okay. As long as I'm not a jerk back to that person, then hey, I'm good, right? Confucius say. But that isn't what Jesus said. Jesus didn't say it. He, he said, that's not good enough. He said, I don't want you to just not do. He said, I want you to do to others. So the way Jesus teaches it is that it's my responsibility. It's your responsibility. That we have to take the initiative as believers in Christ, not only to not be mean, but to actually do the opposite. To actually shower that person with kindness and understanding and compassion to truly, church family, act differently than the rest of the world would. Proverbs 25, it says, we are good to those who persecute us. It's like dumping heaping coals, hot coals on their head. We've all heard the term, kill them with kindness, right? And that's what Jesus wants us to do. This verse beautifully, beautifully ties back to the original, the, the beginning of the teaching in this passage, doesn't it? About judgment. Because it gives us a reference point on how to approach someone else that's struggling in sin. We approach them the way we would want to be approached. With love, and kindness, and gentleness. I think that's why Jesus used an eye for this example. Because the eye is one of the most tender, it's one of the most uh, delicate, it's one of the most intricate parts of the body. And you see, if you were gonna do surgery on an eye, you wouldn't use a set of pliers, right? <laughs> Don't come near my eyes with a set of pliers. I'm telling you right now, okay? We wouldn't use pliers. We would use gentleness. We would use caution. We would use precision. You see, how we treat others shouldn't be determined by how we expect them to treat us. It also shouldn't be determined by how they should treat us. But it should always be by how we want them to treat us. That's the way we treat them. And in closing today, church family, I want, I want you to be reminded that there are so many people in this world that they will never step foot in a church. They will never pick up a Bible and read it. They will never stop and listen to some street corner evangelist. They will not hear the word of God. They will not read the word of God. They will not step into a church. There are people whose only exposure to Christ will be based on how and what and where they see you live your life. And God will send those people to you. He'll send them to you in the bar and grill. He'll send them to you in the gas station. He'll send them to you in the grocery store. He'll send them to your living room. See, we have an opportunity, church family, right now, to take what we learn from the word of God, to take this Sermon on the Mount, to take what Jesus has given us and apply it not only to transform our lives, but to transform the lives of others. So I ask you, will we just be hearers of the word of God? Will we walk out these doors and go back to living just the way everybody else does? Or will we become doers? Will we walk out differently? Jesus asks us in this parable, in this, in this teaching, he says, will you be disciples or dogs? Will you be God's soldiers or just the swine? Remember, the choice is yours. Will you pray with me? Lord, we just thank you. We thank you, God, for your word. We thank you for this family, God. We thank you for, for the conviction that you stir up in each and every one of our lives, not to just coast in this life because we know this life is a, a finite amount of time. But God, you call us to step out in faith. You call us to go and do the hard stuff. God, you call us to be a counterculture. You call us to be different. You call us to be the light and the salt of the earth. 
God, I just pray that as we receive your word today, God, that it would stir something in us, that it would, it would cause us to be transformed from the inside out. It would cause us to, and, and inspire us to go out and make a difference in this world that is so desperate for a savior, God, that is so desperate for answers, that's struggling with the meanings of life, God. And we know that there is nothing that will ever fill that void like you fill it because you are the only piece of the puzzle that fits. And God, I pray today, if there's anyone in this room, I pray that if they've never made that decision to accept you as their Lord and Savior, I pray that today would be that day that there would be something stirring, that they've got that weird feeling in their gut, almost like butterflies to go, you know what, Lord, I don't know what this is. This is kind of scary. I don't know what to expect here, but I know that you're speaking to me and, and, and this, is, this is something that I, I like. And so today, if that's you, I want you to raise your hand right now. Nobody's looking around. But if you are afraid to profess your desire to be a believer in Jesus amongst believers in Jesus, you'll never be able to do it in the outside world. So I want you to raise your hand right now so I know who I'm praying for. And I want you to just say something like this from your heart. Say, today, Jesus, I give you my life. I do, I believe that you are the son of God. I believe that you went to that cross for the salvation of my sins, that you died for me. And I know because the word of God tells me it's so that you are now seated at the right hand of the father and you are looking down on me and you desire a relationship with me. You've been chasing me because I am here today, Lord. God, I wanna be transformed. And I want to live my life in your presence for the rest of my days here. And I am ready to be your soldier. I am ready to be your disciple. Help me understand what that means and I will follow you. Lord, we love you so much. And we thank you for this word today. And it's in your son's mighty and precious name that we pray. And everyone said, amen. As you go out today, John and I wanna challenge you. You know, it's easy to hear a message and be moved and know, yeah, I need to do some things different. But we really wanna encourage you to walk that out. So maybe if this area of judgment is a struggle for you, you find somebody that can kinda help you check your heart and help you when, when you gravitate back towards those ways. Or maybe like when it comes to praying and asking God, I mean, what does your prayer life look like? Do you have a spot you go to meet with God? If not, create one. Do you have a rhythm in your life where that's the first thing that you do so God goes before you? I had lunch with Carol this week and I love, Carol said she goes out first thing in the morning and she stays outside and, and spends time with the Lord until it gets hot. What does your day look like? How do you incorporate that? Because it will change everything. We just wanna challenge you to walk this out because we know it can be easy to be in the presence of God and know what we need to do and walk out into a world of distraction and forget to put him first, amen? So that's our prayer for you. And if you're here today and you need prayer, we have a team that's down front that is happy to stand with you and pray with you about anything. There's also a cross. If you just wanna write it down and put it on the cross, we have an amazing team that prays all week long and they'd be happy to lift you up during the week. And again, we just wanna encourage you in two weeks, it's the two year anniversary, invite some people to come. Let's make it a party and celebrate what God's doing. Have a great week. <laughs>